Let's celebrate my brother on the trumpet. Let's just give a hand to the Lord. <laughs> and the ones on the guitar, let's give a hand to the Lord. What about the drums? A hand to Jesus. And the keyboard. Hallelujah. And the team leading us in worship this morning. We thank God for you. Pastor Rick, you bless, you bless my soul. God bless you for leading us uh, through worship, uh, the leader, overall leader in terms of worship. Let's appreciate Pastor Rick and Akaliche. Amen. Amen. I now want you to appreciate yourself, each one of us. Just appreciate yourself in Jesus' name. Let's appreciate this country. It's called Mali. Let's appreciate Mali, this nation. We appreciate this nation in Jesus' name. There are people who are following this service in the pavilion. Others are in the mother's room downstairs. There are those who are following this service in Asia, in Europe, in the U.S., South America, across Africa, in Australia, and also New Zealand. There are people following this service all over, and they're actually online. Why don't we appreciate the online congregation? Thank you very much. Wherever you are, God bless you. I'm reading the scriptures in just a moment. Uh, there is something important coming next Saturday, and this is uh, uh, for the CEOs, and uh, it is under M-I-L-D, CEOs and Business Owners Breakfast, Project 318, this coming Saturday, 16th of February. The theme is Expansion and Diversity in Business. Esther Mushemi, Group CEO, Samchi Group of Companies, with a speaker. The venue is Move and Pick uh, Hotel, time 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., and the charges are there. It's in their bulletin. I'm just emphasizing in verse 3. And this is because this year we want to take the marketplace. The other one is a volunteer's open day. I'm inviting all of us on the 23rd of February from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, in the pavilion. Come understand the big picture and detailed aspects of PBC as you hear from our shepherds and join breakout sessions on departments and uh, ministries. And there is a site to visit right there. This year, like I said the other Sunday, we want to increase our core group from 5% to 20%. And uh, so we are intentionally reaching out to you to be able to connect uh, with the church and uh, with the ministries of the church. We would like to see your gifts and potentials thrive and deployed for the glory of God. And that's why we have this uh, volunteers special day or open day. Our scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 3. This is a, a reading, a second reading on top of the one of last Sunday. Last Sunday we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. And today I'm continuing the message of last Sunday. So I've added another text. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 31. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 31. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. That is simply to say we are dealing with a revealed righteousness. There is a time when this righteousness was not revealed and it was very, very difficult and complicated before Jesus Christ came. So we are living in a season of revealed righteousness. This righteousness is given, and this is how it comes to us. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, we are dealing with saving faith this month, redeeming the world. It is uh, given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. It's equal for everybody. The way it comes... It comes the same way. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely. That word is important. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This is what God did now in verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, 
so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And that's where we find the justice of God. There are two sides of the coin. One coin is the wrath of God against sin, but the other side of the coin is God's amazing love for the sinner. And hence, therefore, we find the justice of God. Where then, where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith. And again, this is important. I want to repeat that one. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Almighty God, again we celebrate the salvation that you have given to us. And this morning, we know that your saving hand is stretched to every human being on planet Earth. And we are very excited that we are living in this season of grace and that your salvation has been released. And today, my God, as I speak once again from this altar of salvation, we have raised this month the altar of salvation. I am praying that that powerful hand, your powerful hand, will reach out to somebody and lift them up from the pits of life, from the wildernesses and the deserts, and actually save them and save them to the uttermost. My God, I thank you because there is no salvation like the salvation you have offered mankind. And there will never be another salvation like this one. And so, Lord, as I join Paul right to the Romans and Paul right into the Ephesians in presenting the doctrine of salvation or presenting the salvation you have offered to us, I pray that, God, you may use me and that your Holy Spirit would work according to the Scripture. Your Spirit convicts concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. There is no human being who can convict another. Lord, I thank you so much because you're here and you're working and you're going to use your word. Once again, thank you for this wonderful congregation. Thank you for those who are following online. Thank you for those who are in the pavilion. Thank you for those who are in the mother's room. And together, Lord, we know we are coming under the anointing of your word now. Because we've prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. We may have our seats. Again, I say welcome for those uh, who have joined us today for the first time. Uh, the visitors, we love you so much in Jesus' name. I'm Pastor Simon. I'm also glad to see some who are not here last Sunday. And you are part of this congregation. And you are back. I appreciate each one of you. And those who were here last Sunday and you're here, thank you so much. God bless you. My sister Deborah Kaupa is here. Welcome from all the way Chicago. I understand at one point the temperatures were minus 50. Minus 50 degrees Celsius. Eh? Yeah, it was very cold. I can't imagine how that feels. Uh, minus 50 degrees. It's colder than the deep freeze. Imagine you enter a deep freeze. Unajifunika ukondani. It's colder. <clears throat> <clears throat> minus 50 is colder than that and uh, I thank God for the weather today it's very nice, hallelujah God has given us cool weather it was very hot uh, last Sunday I started sharing a message last Sunday titled The Gift of Salvation I did part 1 and uh, there was a part 2 and a part 3 I want to pick it from there The Gift of Salvation and last Sunday we were looking at the text in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 uh, to guide us through the sermon of last Sunday. In Ephesians chapter 2, which is a great text, it is Paul who is writing from uh, house arrest or maybe from prison, but uh, he's telling those who are actually outside, although I'm in prison, I'm not imprisoned. I'm actually alive. I am free. I have been liberated. 
Because what sets us free is not uh, <clears throat> anything human. What sets us free is the power of God. And the Apostle Paul, writing from house arrest, is actually saying, I have known a power within which has actually set me free. And last Sunday, I gave us an outline in three, three ways on the gift of salvation. And I said it's a powerful gift. Secondly, a precious gift. And thirdly, a pass on able gift. We'll have that outline on the screen in just a moment. The gift of salvation. First of all, a powerful gift. Secondly, a precious gift. And thirdly, a personable, a personable, a personable gift. We started by looking at uh, the gift of salvation, a powerful gift. The gift of salvation, a powerful gift. In Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 1, the Bible says, As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. And uh, he's addressing these people and he's saying, this is who you are. You are walking, looking alive, but you are actually dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are, <clears throat> in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following um, its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, uh, we were by nature undeserving of wrath. What he's describing, and I'll go on to verse 7 in terms of reading, is where the watch actually were. And if you remember what I shared last Sunday, they were actually in a deep hole, very deep hole. That's what he's describing. And uh, he's using words to describe this hole, words like uh, sin, uh, dead, sins, transgressions, uh, wayward, following the spirit of this present world that is uh, following Satan. They were actually inside a very deep and very, very dark hole. That's where they actually were. Um, but because of his great love, now he begins to say something else after describing where they were. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, God who is rich in mercy, God who is rich in mercy. I like that. Um, can you hear me? Is the microphone coming clearly? Is the sound coming clearly? God who is rich in mercy. Let me repeat verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive. There is the activity of God which is called saving activity. Right now, God is sitting on the mercy seat. But there is a day when he's going to sit on the judgment seat. Today he's sitting on the mercy seat. And uh, the saving activity of God operates 24-7. And let me say this. Uh, while still, <clears throat> still on verse 4, the saving activity of God. God has a salvation package for a breaking marriage this morning. Hallelujah. Yes, that breaking marriage, God has a plan and God has a, you know, something that he has worked out by his power to save that breaking marriage. God has a salvation plan for a business that is falling apart. God has, a, 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 you know, a plan for finances that are going south. You know, you're in debt. I want to say that God has a saving plan uh, for you. God has a saving plan for a career, you know, that is flagging. A career that is just flagging. God has a, a saving plan for a life that has stagnated. So he's simply saying, and Paul is talking to this church, you should remember where God picked you from. Those of us who study, who have studied uh, Ephesus as a town before Paul, Ephesus before Paul, was, it was a town marked by idols. And these idols were everywhere. You have seen some of these uh, images that you see in some of the places, and uh, they are like animals. Some of them are trees. Some of them are all kinds of idols. That is what Ephesus was. They had a goddess. You know, Artemis. 
and they had a silver, silver smiths, a whole industry for making small goddesses to be put in people's bedrooms, people's sitting rooms, everywhere. And he's saying, you Ephesus, you understand. There was a territorial spirit that had made this city a slave. And this territorial spirit had actually said, Ephesus is mine. And everybody was tied and locked and you are in all kinds of darkness. And this darkness followed you in your sitting room, no peace. In your kitchen, you're trying to cook, no peace. You go through the corridors in a bedroom, you don't find peace. And you think maybe peace is found elsewhere. You live out of your house, you go to Mombasa, trying to walk on the beach. There was no peace. Inside Ephesus, he's talking to these people. And he's saying, before I came, you understand, my friends, where you are. You are actually in a deep pit. You are down there. That's where you are. Caught up in sin, trespasses, wayward ways, transgressions, using different languages, uh, language there, under uh, the grip of Satan. The principalities who rules the air had completely captured your media, had captured your advertisements, had captured your internet, and uh, the evil spirit ebbed out of everything. <clears throat> ebbed out of everything that was actually um, around you. It's, as, it's as, as if it were in Ephesus, this deep darkness, you could even touch it. You know there is a darkness that uh, even when you switch on uh, light, that light kind of disappears because of that deep darkness. And sometimes we live in families, we live in marriages, we live in neighborhoods, and uh, we have uh, businesses. And, and sometimes you feel like the grip of Satan, you know, it's like this deep darkness has completely captured everything. That is how Ephesus actually was. And the, the change in verse 5, you know, you read verse 1 up to verse 4, and you feel like you're reading, uh, you're walking downstairs. It's like you're going downstairs, a downstairs walk. And then, suddenly you reach the bottom, like the, the, the psalmist said, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. And then the tone of the speech changes and it becomes a bit, you know something, a bit. Then, here there is a change in verse 5. From that depressive direction, it is all of us, it's like all of a sudden, Paul begins to say, some light showed up. And he starts saying, now, you, he made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And not just that. I want you to, to, to see the way the uplifting is happening. From down there coming up. Verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ. And that's why it is good to get saved. It is good. And in your own strength, you can't go up this way. It is impossible in your own strength. That's why it's very important to come to Christ. So he's telling Ephesus, when I came and I preached Jesus Christ, this Christ, he did a work no one else could ever do. Nobody. And uh, let me tell you, in Ephesus, there was government. We know government tries to uplift the standard of living. Government has strategies. Government has plans to save people from economic situations, uh, security issues. The government presents certain packages or salvation plans or, you know, salvage plans. But there is one plan that is bigger than a plan ever put together by any government, ever put together by any community or group of people, ever set up by any altar, any altar ever raised. And I know historically, communities have tried to get salvation by facing mountains, facing trees, by sacrificing animals, all kinds of things. But he's telling the Ephesian church that there is one name you need to underline. And that is the name Jesus Christ. Because this is the name that made all the difference. And when I came to you, this is what I preached. So in verse 6, it begins to go a bit. It's very interesting. What you find in Ephesus and the write-up of Ephesus has its wider explanation in the book of Romans. Because when you study the book of Romans... Uh, you start by going downstairs. Romans chapter 1, 
chapter 2, chapter 3, you're going downstairs, downstairs, downstairs. A very depressing picture of mankind without Christ. So you go downstairs, downstairs. Until you reach Romans 3, verse 23, where it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's like Paul penning and says, That's enough. I have said enough of the downward road. I must now, on this Roman road, I must now begin to lift us up. And as he begins from Romans 3, and, and uh, you know, verse uh, 24, and I read those, those verses, uh, something beautiful begins to happen, and it's a justification path, and there's an uplifting, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the finished work of Jesus on the cross, and it's all a justification, and in verse 23 of 6, it says, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the free, free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on, and the height of it is Romans chapter 8, after he has said in Romans chapter 7, who shall free me from this bondage? And he says, I can't. The Spirit of God actually can. In Romans chapter 8, he goes on to say, now I know that nothing in this creation is able to separate me from the love of God. And he goes on to say, I am therefore more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is from last Sunday. I shared uh, these verses. Then from verse 6, it says, And God raised us up, and I can make it in first person because I am born again. I accepted Jesus at the age of uh, just about 17 years, and I was in high school. And I know what this means, to give it from first person, that Jesus raised me from a grave. Jesus uh, raised me from a pit of sin and pit of trust trespasses. And Jesus freed me from the grip of Satan. So he says the following to the Ephesian church. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us. Now look at this. Lifted, lifted, and raised. And that's why last Sunday I was talking about it's a powerful gift. The gift of salvation, when you receive it, there is a work it does in your life. It's a very powerful gift. Raised us up, one level of glory to another one, to another one. Are you, have you been caught up in drugs and you have been abusing drugs and you have been locked in this prison by those drugs and even the drugs have started demanding things from your life and the drugs are the ones that control where you go, where you don't go, what you take, what you don't take and therefore you have come under bondage to drugs. Now that is a grave and let me tell you no rehab center, no rehab center Anywhere in the world can set you free. No rehab center can actually lift you from, the, from, from that pit. But there is a power that is in the gospel. And this is the saving power that is able to open any prison, that is able to break any chain, that is able to lift a person from a pit that can completely set you free. And not just free, but raise you from that grave to the place where you will not see that grave again because of the elevation. Lift you up to a place where the powers of darkness can all, no longer you know, pull you down. And so he says, and raised us up with Christ and seated us, not just raised us up, but also gave us rest. You know, the rest of salvation. Raised us up and then seated us, uh, you know, together with Christ in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 7, in order that in the coming ages he might show, and the reason why God does this is so that he, we can become what is called trophies of grace. A trophy of grace. You know, a trophy. Because Jesus did a great work and then he has produced this work and this work has changed a person like Pastor Simon and then I become a trophy of grace. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Incorrup incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness, his kindness, God is so kind. And to me as a person, first person me, expressed to me and in Christ Jesus. So Paul is speaking to this church and he's telling them, you know where you are and you know where you are. Martin Luther, and this is the Martin Luther of the Reformation. Around 1500 all the way to 1510 was a time of reform inside his life. And then he couldn't keep this reform inside his life alone. 
he thought the whole world must know about it. And that is why we are talking about saving faith, redeeming the world. He, he thought this, the whole world must know about this. God saved his life just at the turn of the 1500 in a storm. And then he committed himself. He said, God, if you save my life, I'm going to serve you in a new way. Then he read Romans 1.17. That says the just shall live by faith. And he realized works have no place. It's got to be faith. All the way. And you know, later on, he wrote and he said, if anybody would truly be a worshiper of God, he must read Romans. You know, Paul's letter to the Romans and understand the kind of salvation they have received. If you want to meet somebody who is a true worshiper, worshiping with abandon, somebody who comes to the church, doesn't care who is sitting next to them, but they know they have come to the house of the Lord. And they are not trying to, to add bonga points from anything or anybody. They, they worship. It is somebody who understands where God has picked them from and where God has actually put them. When you understand the nature of the gift of salvation that God has given you and the power that it was released to lift you from that pit, and put you where you are. You won't care who is around. You lift your hands and you just worship. You kneel down. You can go prostrate down, flat. I mean, because you know, and truly you can say, I know where I was. I have experienced the power of God. And I know where God has actually put me now. The liberating power. If we go back to the outline, just give me the outline if you have it. The gift of salvation. So last Sunday, for those who are coming in for the first time, it was first of all a powerful gift. Verse 1 to 7 of Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, this is simply to say liberating. The powerful gift that is very liberating. There is no other gift like this you can receive that actually liberates. John chapter 8 verse 36 says, Whoever the Son of God says free is, free indeed. John chapter 8 and verse 36. As we continue, not only is it a powerful gift, it is also, uh, secondly, a precious gift. A precious gift. This is amazing. A precious gift. It is paid for. Not just paid for. There is another word. Fully paid for. Fully paid for. A precious gift. Fully paid for. For those who are writing, add another word there. And the word is fully paid for. In verse 8 and 9 of Ephesians chapter 2. Remember, and I think some of us have memorized this one. It is by grace through faith that we've been saved. Yeah, yeah, it is there. For it is by, let's read it together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. In verse 9, not by works so that no one can boast. Human work is good, but human work cannot earn salvation. And therefore, God looked at mankind, all the way from Genesis, the fall of man, to the coming of Jesus Christ, the whole of that period. And he realized this, these human beings will never reach me, will not be able uh, to get salvation unless I intervene, unless I do, I do something. I want us to understand that what God did was precious. Very expensive. I don't know how to put it. I don't know how to illustrate it. The most expensive thing ever done for humankind. And therefore, to reject it. That's why this cannot be forgiven. To reject this gift is to say, I mean, there is no other thing now left. When you stand before God and I stand before God, the first question he'll ask is, did you receive my gift? And some people will ask, which gift? Did you receive my gift? And there is only one gift like this one, this precious gift. There is only one gift of this kind. And this is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, who actually died on the cross and paid the price that was needed to be paid for your sin and my sin, for our transgression, but also for the whole salvation package. The whole salvation. This Bible, as you, as you know it, this one here, is a story of salvation. From end to end. 
And uh, the gift that activates, you know, this plan, activates the plan, is Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the Bible says. Fully paid for. The word redemption, to redeem or redemption, is a transactive word. And it was used in the slave market those days to redeem. And what happened was that uh, somebody would come, identify a slave, and buy the slave. Buy a slave from the market. And after buying the slave, gets out with the slave, and then tells the slave, you are free. There are some slaves who never knew how to live the life that is free in Christ. And so they hovered around the market. But somebody who comes and pays the price for the slave, and he said, because I have paid uh, this amount for you, now you can go free. That was the redemption fee, to redeem. Now let me put it this way. When you look at the cross, that is the redemption fee. When you look at the cross... And what Jesus did on the cross, shedding the blood, and he was buried, of course, and he rose. That is God saying, I have paid the price. Every time you look at this cross, it is God saying, I have paid the price. I, because I love you, I have paid the price. Your salvation is now free. You can actually uh, receive it. In Romans chapter 3, we'll have this on the screen. Verse 22, Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. I just want to read it there so that we get it from Romans, from verse 22. This righteousness is given, it's a gift, it's a gift through faith and through faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now look at verse 24, verse 24. And all are justified freely, freely, by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Now, verse 25. This is now the cross. God presented Christ as a sacrifice. That's what he did. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Our work is to receive what God has actually given, uh, this free gift, this precious gift, by faith. He, this, he did this to demonstrate uh, his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand uh, unpunished. A precious gift. The word grace as an acronym, grace, an acronym, simply means God's riches at Christ's expense. G for God, R for riches, uh, A at C, Christ, E, expense. God's riches at Christ, expense. Your salvation is paid for. I think this is one of the greatest statements I could ever make from an altar of salvation. I'm making a pronouncement. Your salvation is fully paid for. And therefore, you don't have to earn it or struggle. How do you enter your rest? How do you enter saving rest? By knowing God did it all. By knowing that I don't have to struggle anymore. And so when I'm praying, I don't have to pray like I have eaten some bitter pills. I pray with glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> there is salvation rest. Because God did it. And so when I'm praying, I'm praying from a point of gratitude and a point of celebration and a point of thanksgiving. Because I've come from the cross, I have seen the cross, it was all done for me. Now the storehouses of God are open and it's all by grace, it's all by his mercy. Every door has been, you know, pushed open. And so I'm coming and I'm looking up the storehouses of God and I'm simply saying, thank you for providing do you remember how Jesus prayed for the multiplication of bread? He simply thanked the father. And the, small, the lunch given by the young lad was multiplied just like this. Understanding grace is everything. 
Understanding grace is everything. God reaches at Christ's expense. I see a lot of people struggling. And even there are some denominations that are built around a wrong theology. And people wrestle and struggle. It's as if Jesus did nothing. You know? Now, all of that was done on the cross. So that now we can enjoy the full life of God. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the work of the enemy. But Jesus came that we might do what? Have life and have it abundantly. Why don't you give a hand clap to Jesus? I think that is something, something beautiful, something wonderful. This salvation is fully paid for. It's like going to one of the supermarkets here in uh, Nairobi. Say, for example, Carrefour. And uh, somebody tells you right at the door, as you enter here, everything here is paid for. Just simply carry what, <laughs> what you can. I don't know what you'd go for. <laughs> Some people don't even believe, and this is where faith comes in, that it has been paid for. So those, those who don't believe, they'll go pick small things so that by the time they come to the ticketing, ticketing place, <laughs> yeah, they are not embarrassed. And they're asked, where is the money? Now when God says, I have paid for everything in this supermarket, God actually means it. My brother, Dr. Gishane, we had a meeting yesterday uh, somewhere, uh, last night, and uh, remember the story you actually gave us of this guy who took a flight. I don't know whether it was from Kenya and uh, was going to Europe. Uh, he had paid the ticket. But now one thing he didn't fully understand is that that ticket included his meals. I mean the meals that come with the trolley. And therefore, as food was coming, people would take but him, he decided, I am not touching because I don't have money <laughs> to pay for these meals. After they reached, I think, somewhere in Europe, the friend asked him, how come, while we were coming from Africa, you are not eating? He told the friend, you know what? Because I, I, didn't, I didn't have money to pay. Then the friend told him, by the way, the ticket you paid includes the meals. So when they boarded now for the U.S., this guy really, really enjoyed, <laughs> enjoyed himself. There are two types of believers. One who understands grace and that the heavens are open and that God wants us to pick the finest and the best because he has worked out the salvation package and therefore we walk in rest, we walk with a smile and with, a joy, uh, with joy and thanksgiving. And one believer who doesn't fully trust God, saving faith takes you to understanding grace. But the other one who doesn't fully trust God, and although they are born again, they look like a God who is mean, who has not opened the storehouses, as God who doesn't want to give the best and the finest. And so in their prayer life, in their daily walk, demeanor, emotional peace, I mean emotional situation, there is like something that's uh, kunjuad. I don't know how to put it. Yes. <laughs> well, like Pastor Ambrose, let me use the word kunjuad. <laughs> and I say it's Greek. Yeah. Something kunjuad. <laughs> yeah. There's just something that's not coming through. Grace. The word grace is a flow. That word, gracious, there's just something about grace. And when we understand grace, then that same grace starts flowing uh, in and through us. It's a precious gift, very expensive. Nobody could ever uh, pay for our redemption or atonement for our sins. But God in his love and also in his mercy freely did it on the cross. And because of that, everything is now available for the children of God. And that's why Paul is saying, it is by grace through faith we've been saved. Paul, who is writing this, understands grace. He knows without grace, he wouldn't be who he was. Paul knows he was a murderer. And he, he led a murderous army to destroy Christians. But God, by his saving hand, reached out to the apostle Paul, turned him around. It was instantaneous, that salvation. You know? And then he lifted Paul up, caused him to sit together with Christ in the heavenlies. This is Paul who is writing this letter. He understands the power of grace, but also he also understands how precious it is. It is fully paid for. And therefore, Paul is not going back to his past. He's not walking in guilt. When Jesus washes your sins, 
He washes them away completely. Psalm 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your transgression. Cleansed completely. Somebody is struggling with guilt. And you feel like God could not have forgiven this particular sin or that particular sin. You guys don't understand my history, my background. And you find somebody struggling. Yet this salvation is a complete salvation. Is a total salvation. Is a salvation that sets you free. Cleanses you completely through the blood of Jesus. But also puts you in a very nice place. And it's all paid for. Can you imagine? You are undertaking a trip. Somebody tells you, I have paid for your journey to and fro. What would stop you from entering that bus? Yet some people know this has been done. People know this has been done, all paid for, but they have not yet entered the bus or connected to this bus. My question to you uh, this morning is what are you waiting for? If you are born again, don't be like the elder brother, the prodigal son, you remember, had an elder brother who doesn't understand grace. All of these things belong to the Father. You know? All of these things belong to us. And so, when there's a new kid on the block, one who has come back from prodigality and his sins are forgiven, the elder son is not understanding the magnanimity of the Father, the kindness of the Father, the grace of the Father, the goodness of the Father, and he's beginning to complain. There are some people who have been saved for a long time, but you have never fully been released because you haven't understood, uh, you know, the grace of God. Therefore, you become very judgmental. Judgmental to yourself and even to everybody else who is around you. And for this reason, you don't even access what is yours in the Father's house. Yet, you are in the Father's house. It takes the Father to say, don't, don't all these things, all these things, don't they belong to you? And have always belonged to you? Why are you bothered that your son, your brother, younger brother, who was lost in sin, has actually come in? And let me say this, Dr. Mativo. I have seen even in churches, we have a tendency of denominational going like a club. And new people coming in find it very difficult. <laughs> very difficult. Assimilation of new people becomes very, very difficult. Because the ones who got there before are making it very difficult for the one who is uh, actually coming in. What God wants is a grace expressed so that uh, the one who is actually coming in actually finds a space also to grow. This grace is quite amazing. It opens the doors, the storehouses of God, and God is saying, I hold back nothing. What we have received, we have received fully, uh, fully and also freely. Finally, let me say, this gift of salvation is personable, personable, personable. I don't know whether this is correct English. It's not a personal gift. That word should change. It is pass on able, pass on able. Let me put it this way. P-A-S-S -S hyphen. Yeah, P-A-S-S -S hyphen, O-N then hyphen able, pass on able, which simply means go tell, go tell. This gift is not a gift to be kept uh, in a store somewhere. It's a gift to, go, to be given out. After this, I'm going to Kajiaro. And I'm going to join a group, uh, the Global Worship Center. And as I go there, I am going to unveil something called the Global Cathedral. The churches there have come together, several churches, and they have said, we are going to take Nairobi for Jesus. That's why I'm going after this service. We are going to take Nairobi for Jesus. And you know what they told me when we've had meetings with them? They told me, Pastor, we know that in Nairobi, out of 10 people, only one shows up in church. That's the statistics right now. Out of every 10 people, only one shows up in church. We may look like we are many. This can be deceptive. But the truth is this. Out of 10 people in Nairobi, only one, 10%, only one shows up in church. Nine don't. So this group of churches came and told me, Pastor, we want to be go churches. And we want to reach the nine. We are coming to Nairobi. And the concept is called the global cathedral. And we want to reach those nine. We want to see everyone in Nairobi turn to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's give a hand to the Lord.
Amen. <clears throat> the gift of salvation is a, is a gift that makes me restless. It will make you restless. Because of the way it is precious and it's very good. You want to tell somebody else about this gift. And uh, not just near, but also far. Acts 1, 8 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Go tell. So in Ephesians 2, 10, Paul says, you will be his workmanship. God has seen works that you need to do, that he created or prepared in advance. There is an assignment for every person that God has prepared ahead of time. And the go person, the person who passes the gift on, gets to know this assignment and connects with it. And I'm convicted and convinced that this prepared works, or what God wants us to do, is to go and tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. The greater works that Jesus talked about in John 14, verse 12, John 14 and verse 12, these greater works are to go out there. Very verily, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than this, because I'm going to the Father. This is what God wants us to do. You are born again. Don't just make it a personal, some people say, <laughs> my personal savior, and, and they want to keep Jesus as a personal asset, but they don't want to share. I want to thank God for the Samaritan woman. In, 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 Acts, uh, in the book of John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, from verse 39. John chapter 4, from verse 39. This is what the Bible says to verse uh, 42. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. Isn't that wonderful? They believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. This is the first evangelist. Actually, uh, as we know, in the New Testament, this woman who goes out, the first evangelist, because of her testimony, he told me everything I ever did in verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. 41. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we, we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is a savior of the world. The woman's testimony. Do you have a testimony? That testimony can change somebody else's life. Don't keep it to yourself. Pass it on. Jesus changed your life. Determined to reach somebody else and share the love of God with them. How shall we change the world? With each reaching each. One reaching another. After this service, can you imagine after this service, if all of us determined this week to share the gospel with one person, not two, just one person, every one of us. I think here we are probably around 3,000, approximately 3,000 people listening to me. Others are online. Can you imagine if each one of us shared the gospel with one person? How many people shall we reach this week? How many people? Yeah, 3,000, isn't it? Yes, 3,000. If every one of us shared the gospel, we will reach about 3,000 people. Can you imagine if each one of us shared with two people? How many shall we reach? 6,000. It's amazing. We have a gift, but we are not passing on. We are not passing it on. The challenge this month from this altar of salvation is that we develop a personal ministry of reaching out to somebody else. Maybe your neighbor, maybe your classmate, for those who are in school, uh, your business partner, and you share the gospel. Share the gospel plainly. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them that Jesus loves them. Tell them that Jesus died for them. Tell them that Jesus from the, rose from the dead. And tell them that Jesus is able for, to save them from their pit. The apostle Paul did his bit. The, the apostle Paul was a go person. And as an individual, he left the comfort of his church in Antioch. And he took a very difficult uh, path uh, through Cyprus in southern Asia, I mean, southern Europe, and went all the way to Rome. The Apostle Paul, one man, and he took a second trip, and he took a third trip. 
The whole missionary enterprise that started in Europe is courtesy of Paul when the work he did in Macedonia and some of the towns that were there, including Ephesus. And down the road, people from Europe came and evangelized us here in Africa. Africa has received a big, big blessing. And the wheel has turned to the extent that the call to take the gospel to the ends of the earth is now upon the African church. And if the African believer, the African church, does not take this mantle at this season and time that we are in, then no one will actually do it. I have no time to tell you the statistics regarding lostness. And that's why when we gather like this, numbers can be deceptive. I talked about nine people who are not in church. They haven't come to church. We don't know what they are doing. But you look at global statistics. Europe right now is a lost part of the world. It needs to be reached once again. Much of Asia, South America, North America, there are so many people who have not heard this gospel. Yet we have said, number one, it's a powerful gift. We have experienced it. Number two, it's a precious gift. We have experienced this. The challenge then comes to us, how are we reaching out? I don't know how many of us here have a plan this, this month of February. This is a month of saving faith. How many have put together a plan of reaching somebody else for Christ? You can, today, as part of the altar call response, you can actually say, even this afternoon, if you don't do it right away, Lord, show me, make it clear to me, the people I should reach. You can go beyond that today and write some names. That's what I do. You write some names. Maybe three names, five names, ten names, twenty names. Beginning with your family and people outside your family. And you bring that paper before the Lord. And you say, my God, you have given me a powerful gift and a precious gift. I want to pass it on. I bring these names before you and I'm asking for their salvation. Because God, you've already done your bit. Now I am doing my bit. I want to tell somebody uh, what God has actually uh, you know, done for me. And I tell you, when you start there, God will give you the compassion and the love of Christ in your heart. You will find somehow doors will open for conversations. And you will surprise yourself. <laughs> you will surprise yourself when somebody says, this week... I want to receive Jesus because of your testimony. I want to receive Jesus. Is it possible next Sunday that we have a celebration uh, even as we do the constitution uh, ratification or endorsement after the service? Is it possible that next Sunday we will have a service where it is just reports? My brother there says, I have led two to the Lord. Another one, my sister here, three to the Lord. And somebody else on the other side is saying five to the Lord and one to the Lord, and you have come with them to church, can you imagine how that would be? Is it possible to have a service like that? Do you believe with me? There is a word I'm trying to get, disenchamphrized. Is it called what? Dis yeah. People were dis that word. Eh? <laughs> but the, by this division of clergy and laity, something. That was the worst thing that ever happened in church history. All of us are called. Hallelujah. All of us are priests. All of us can lead somebody to Christ. But there's a mindset that has been developed over time and it's a lie of the devil. That the pastor and the pulpit must do all the work will lead the people to Christ. I want to disabuse that. This go tell is for everyone. Hallelujah. And so this week, yes, you can give a hand to the Lord. It's okay. This week, this week, my prayer is this. That you will change that paradigm and change that mindset. The devil has used it to cause the church not to grow for a long time. You will work against it by simply writing those names. Bring them before the Lord and then say, Lord, give me courage. I'm, I, I'll have my list. In fact, even now, as I go to Kajiara, where I'm going, <laughs> I'm starting there. I'm starting right there. I'll have my list. Yeah? This week, bring that list to the Lord. And next Sunday, my prayer is this. 
In fact, Sunday services are supposed to be celebrations. They're supposed to be testimony times. Where we just say, so many have turned to the Lord because of my life. And I know many of us wait for the altar call. When the pastor stands here and says, upstairs come, this other side come. No, we should not be waiting for that moment. The altar call must be made everywhere, all over the city. In our offices, in our schools, from our streets, everywhere we go, in aeroplanes, because we are sharing this gospel. I have shared with you about the gift of salvation. First of all, it's a powerful gift. Secondly, it's a precious gift. And thirdly, it's a gift to be passed on. It's a personable gift. This morning, do you know the power of this gift? Do you truly know it? Have you been delivered? Have the chains been broken? Have you been truly set free? Are you raised with Christ and seated together with him in the heavenly realms? Do you know it truly in your heart that you've been lifted and set free? Secondly, do you understand that this gift is free? That will turn you into a worshiper. You will walk out thanking God for Jesus doing all the work on the cross. And we have the pictures of the crosses here. Thanking God. May God give you a heart of thanksgiving and gratitude. But finally, if you truly know the first two, the power and the value of this gift of salvation, you will, if you truly know the first two, you will run through this door to go tell somebody of what God has done through Jesus Christ on the cross. And so today is basically a commissioning service. And I'm praying that as we leave this place, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. We shall go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us. And then he says, Lo, I'll be with you to the end of the age. The church in Africa, arise, shine, and go, because the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon the church in Africa. And God is saying, I'm releasing resources for my people to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. And the people who are here, here in Parklands Baptist Church, representing so many others around the world, I believe are taking the front seat. And this morning, you are actually saying, together with the ones uh, listening to me online, here I am, Lord, send me, like Isaiah. If you are one of those who is saying, I am taking this mantle of the gospel, and I'm taking it to somebody because it's a gift this coming week. Just stand up. Let's all, yeah, just stand up. I believe it's everybody who is saying, yes, I'm going to do it. Hallelujah. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. Amen. Amen. Mm. I want us to sing a verse of this power in the blood of Jesus. Just give me a note. A lower key. Uh, Ferdinand. Mm. Raise it just a little bit. Just one note. Mm. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood once again, there is power. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Precious blood of the Lamb. This is me. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious Now, you won't go for go, 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 to lift our hands to God. Almighty God, we have just sung the words from that song or that hymn that testifies of your power, 
the power that is in the blood of Jesus. And we thank you that this power in the blood of Jesus is able to save every human being from whichever pit or depth they may be. The pit, the pit of sin, the pit of transgressions, the pit of defeat. And I thank you because this blood is not only powerful, this blood is precious. And not only is it powerful and precious, it is a blood that has been sprinkled. Therefore, it can be passed on. My God, I thank you for these hands that are lifted. These are hands that believe in your saving power. These are hands that believe in the power that is in the blood of Jesus. And my God, I take time to commission your people, including myself, Parklands Baptist Church, I see a new commissioning, a release of the power of the blood of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit that will take us to this city in a new way. As we leave this church today, Lord, I'm seeing a commissioned people who are going to write a ministry of outreach and that ministry with names because of the power of blood, the blood of Jesus. And they're going to minister this power in the lives of real people. And God, I see a people who have lifted up their hands as they minister the saving grace and get saving power who will see results. And this coming week, my God, I'm seeing people saved. I'm seeing people healed. I'm seeing people restored. I'm seeing people lifted to a new level. Lord, I'm seeing your hand in a new way in the city of Nairobi. And some people are flying out of the country wherever we are going because of your power. My Lord, I thank you because I am fast on the line in committing myself to preach this gospel. And this coming week, I am releasing the power of salvation, the gift of salvation through our, your people, my God, on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, on Sunday. I'm seeing salvation in our homes. Our children are getting saved. Our fathers are getting saved. Our mothers are getting saved. I see this gift of salvation in our offices. Our bosses are getting saved. Our colleagues are getting saved. Lord, I see it on the streets, even in matatus and buses. Oh, I'm praying a revival, a move of the Holy Spirit. People will be saved when they are standing at bus stops. I see a vision. People will be kneeling down inside supermarkets. I see people lifting up their hands inside supermarkets in Jesus' name because of the saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ. My God, these hands that are lifted are hands that know there is salvation in no other name except in Jesus Christ. There is no other place to receive salvation except in Jesus Christ. These are believers in God's saving power. And God, because we do so, we are going to share this power. As I commission the church today, I am seeing a flow of God's power and presence flowing from here to the ends of the earth. We rededicate ourselves as a church to preaching this gospel and Lord to leading people to salvation. As I pray now, my Father, I know there is somebody who has come and they need saving power for their business. They need saving power for their marriage. They need saving power for a stagnated situation. They need saving power in a discouragement. They say they need saving power in a sickness. They need to sense saving power in their children. Something that's been very difficult in their children's life. Somebody seeking saving power because of a debt they have. With the authority I have in union with Jesus. And from this salvation altar, I now decree and it's already done the opening of the heavens and I also decree the stretching of God's saving hand in your direction today from this altar I decree the, an uplifting by the hand of God the breaking of yokes and bondages and chains and opening of prisons and I am decreeing the saving healing coming in your direction and I want to promise you my brother my sister this week you will see the hand of God Remember those words as you go out. You will see the saving hand of God. This week, this week, you will see the saving hand of God 
in your situation. I am a firm believer in the power of that hand. And this week, not your strength, not your power. God is coming miraculously and he is saving you in that situation. And therefore, allow me to speak this saving hand over your life on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, and this coming Sunday. I see salvation throughout the week in the name of Jesus Christ. My Father, I thank you. I thank you. And I bless you. Let's lift our hands up to God. My God, again, I thank you. Because of this saving hand. And because I can see what you're doing this week. Even for uh, our economy. I am speaking the saving hand of God inside the Kenyan economy. The saving hand of God across the continent of Africa. Our hope lies only in you. Father, I thank you. As we lift up our hands, because of this saving hand, I'm seeing also a flow of blessings. My brother, my sister, walk out of this sanctuary saying, I am blessed through and through. God is releasing these blessings by his hand. And there is no curse that can uh, reverse this blessing that God is, uh, is, is actually releasing. You are blessed indeed. Anybody saying anything else is a liar. And you are blessed once again on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and this coming Sunday. And because of this blessing, you will see doors opening. And God will be standing there with you and taking you through. Our God is more than able. And I have prayed this prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all say, a big hand clap to Jesus. Our God is able. He's a Savior. He is a Savior. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.